Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all here and thank everyone for tuning in. I'm Chester Levash. I'm the project archaeologist with the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. And I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Arthur Cruz of uh, Okeowinge. Before we get started, I would like to uh, remind you to tune into next month's lecture when I will be talking about uh, conserving sonic heritage, uh, examples of the importance of soundscapes to rock art landscapes. So, uh, but for, for this month, um, again, I welcome you to the uh, Mesa Talks hosted by Los Luceros State Historic Site and the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. Uh, with us is Mr. Arthur Cruz, who will be talking about Fiogi Pueblo and First Mesa. So, uh, Art, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and uh, give us more uh, of an idea of what you will be talking about? Sure. Yes, uh, good afternoon to the, the audience. <clears throat> My name is Arthur Cruz. I am a full-blooded Tewa from Okeowinge, formerly known as San Juan Pueblo. I am of the Summer Clan. I am a graduate from Haskell College in Lawrence, Kansas. I have um, been a government uh, contractor throughout my career, as well as a gallery owner. Um, I also do contract work with archaeological projects as a cultural advisor. And in more recent years, also I've taught the Tewa language. At this time, I like to talk in my Tewa language as an introduction before um, I go on. And I'll be out in the uh, in よの。ほんとは、ちかぽは、え、天気を我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也有一碗。我也
Kau tu amir. Ebo ebo ahir eh tu bunga ahir oh. Pecahkan itu pare. Kau campur. Ia wina ego te. Kau na tepi. Kau na tepi lah. Kau eh oh. Ya eh tanya ni. Bo. Isi dia. You will know. The women did it. Didn't do it. Did it. They won them. So you will know. They will. They will not be. They will feel again too. You will know. They will cry. How are you to you? Ane ni, ni wili di piwa. Mungkin ni mewa. Hari pawa, hari kuamwa. Aw, besi ni mewa. Ane ni kosong dia. Mewa itu le. Kui berau, mewa itu le. Berau. Berau, ini nanti mu. Ina waring ko, deta na, ha, tewari, disewa ane. Ah, kopi ya, wah. Eh, beri tahu aje pun, wah ini. Oh, iya, nampi netan eh, itu kafe mai. Nampak wah, wah, umi pengen bimu. Tapi kopi ya, wah. Nenek nak nampi, nenek nak orang faris. Entrao. Y acá no tuve nada. Estoy en con él. A ver tu mamá. En todo respeto a todos los que escuchan en la audiencia. De afuera. De los pueblos. De los pueblos. De los pueblos. De los pueblos. And this is a story that's been left by our elders from San Juan Pueblo. Uh, more specifically, Mr. Herman Agoyo, was the summer clan, Stephen Trujillo, winter clan, Geronimo Montoya, winter clan, and, and other uh, outside sources from various uh, archaeological um, agencies that said and uh, the writing and hearing the story by the elders but uh, this was written and was left and our brother uh, Herman fell sick before he got worse and asked him to assist and he entrusted me to to help finish the story. So as we finished, I finished. Uh, they took the courtesy to visit him at his home, give him the respect, and read the story to him. And in the end, I asked him how he felt, were there any changes that were to be made? And he said no. He gave me his thumbs up finger. With that, I took the responsibility from that point. Take it on the challenge and finish the story. Working with many other people from, from Hano, third, third Mesa. And, and any of the other archaeologists and that um, were as a reference point to the the old village itself. So with that, I'd say that the the village of Theoge itself was one of the original villages that was part of the migration period from Mesa Verde, 
we know it is Deva Yoga. And they set off on the east side of the Rio Grande below the Black Mesa. And so that's where they lived from 1250 to late 1690s. They left before the second coming of the Spanish. But they didn't want to be part of that. But they were already in the first part. And those stories are written up in the hills, in the Black Mesa of that event. But with this, and the acknowledgement of the visit and the four visits by the Taylor runners seeking assistance, they were summoned by the chiefs of Wapi, the Snake, and the Bear Clan. And on the fourth request, they accepted. And from there, they went forth. But right after, before I go on and, and with the story, I just want to acknowledge that I don't miss them. The people that contributed to the credits of the story, Mr. Dr. Scott Wortman, who's the author of The Winds of the North, The Table Origin and Historical Anthropology, Mr. Mark Gurian, Pro Canyon, his work on Fiogia, established 1250 to 1700s, consisted of 1200 rooms with two kibos. Uh, coordinates, height number was LA-144, and coordinates were 40699-2 East, 399-7009 North, Mr. Herman Aguil, Summer Clan, Mr. Stephen Trujillo, the Winter Clan, Veronimo Montoya, Winter Clan. Research by Elsie Claus Carson on Pueblo Indian Religion, Volume 2, Hano. J.P. Harrington. Scott Al Carpenter, Inner Resource Planning. Um, Fioge Archaeological Site. Um, Arthur Cruz, uh, Summer Clan. At that time, uh, I worked in the realty department. Oral history, the elder. Her oral history, that of Oribe Chief Loloma. Hopi leadership throughout supported the summons of the Tewa by the chiefs of Wapi, the Bear Clan and Snake Clan. In this time in history, in the events then, there were only seven families, or you can consider them seven warriors. They were known as the Wapi Seven. So with this, again, story, Piyoge, Uwinge, the Pewa story. I would like to take a uh, quick minute to mention that after today's video, we will have a online Q&A. So please post your questions to our uh, Facebook events page, and uh, I will read them back to Art so that he can answer them for you. This is a story of a Tewa Pueblo that is located north of the present-day Tewa village of Okeowinge on the east side of the Rio Grande River that flows below the Black Mesa, known as Mesa Pedra. Fiyoge Uinge 
was established and inhabited during the period of 1250 through 1700s by Artewa people. Fiyogi Uwinge is translated as the place of the flicker. On the mesa to the west, Black Mesa, Mesa Piedra, there they documented their daily lives and stories in the form of petroglyphs that are carved into the rock. During this time frame, many of the villages which migrated down from Tewayoge, Mesa Verde, settled along the Rio Grande and Rio Chama rivers were being faced by hardships from outsiders and the environmental conditions that affected their survival as a people. And farther west into Hopi country, the peoples there also suffered from hardships and the invasion of various tribes that were invading their homelands for food, livestock, etc. Fiyogi and Saiwari Uinge were two of the Tewa villages summoned by Wapi chiefs to assist them in their dilemma of promising them a better life. And this time, the leaders of Fiyogi gathered his people, making them aware they were going to be leaving their village as well as not wanting to associate with the Spaniards when they returned in the following years, 1692. As they left Yogi Uinge, some of the people moved into Oke Uinge. The remaining group were joined by the group of Sanwari in their journey to Hopi. The leaders left the caretaker in charge of the village, herein known as Grandmother. With this story unfolds. <clears throat> this story is dedicated to Mr. Herman Goyal, a leader, elder, and the Chupare of Oke Uinge. A table story, Fioke Uinge. This is a short story of a Tewa Pueblo that was located north of the present day village, Tewa village of Oke Uinge, on the east side of the Rio Grande River that flows below the Black Mesa. The village of Yoga Uinge was established and inhabited during the period of 12, 1250 to 1700 by our Tewa people. Fioge is translated as the place of the flicker. The village consisted of 1,200 rooms and two kibas. These people were farmers, potters, hunters, and gatherers. The village of Fioge set, set on the east foothills of the Rio Grande River. The fields were located within the valley adjacent to the Mother River, the Rio Grande, and the Black Mesa. As per oral history passed by tribal elders of Okeoinge, the village of Fiyogeoinge was lively and occupants were doing the traditional rituals. They planted and harvested their crops. They hunted game. On the mesa to the west, there the 
They documented their daily lives in the form of petroglyphs that are carved into the rock that told their stories of their lives. In this time frame, many of the villages that settled along the Rio Grande and Rio Chama were being faced with hardships from outsiders and the environmental conditions that affected their survival as a people. And further west into Hopi country, the peoples also suffered from hardships such as no rain, non-abundance of crops, and the invasion of bands of various tribes that were invading their homelands for food and livestock, etc. The people of Hiyogi were one of two table villages summoned by the Wapi chiefs of Hopi, the other being Tsaiwari, to assist them with their dilemma of the Marauding tribes. So then, in this particular time period, the village of Hioge gathered and made the people aware that they will be leaving their village as well as not wanting to associate with the Spaniards when they returned in the following years of 1692. They prepared a bundle of cornmeal a coral necklace, turquoise necklace, and other traditional items and buried them on the Black Mesa just west of the village. This was a sign that they would return someday and recover them back. After this, they began their journey to Hopi to assist them. The Hopi people have promised the Tewa people a better life such as abundance of game, agricultural land, or crops, or water, and land to be build a new life. This was to the contrary. As the story unfolds, the Tewa people of Hiyogi were asked by the Bear Clan and the Snake Clan chiefs of Wapi, Hopi, to come out and assist them. This was done with concurrence of the Hopi villages throughout Hopi land. It is with this that the people of this village were told of their plan. As they left Fioge, some of the people moved to Okeowinga, and the others remaining group were joined by its unwanted group and began their journey west to Hopi. As it was then, the people of Fioge left a person in their village as a caretaker. She was an elder woman known as grandmother. As she realized the loneliness and ventured through the streets of the plaza and throughout the kibas, she heard crying in the distance. She listened to get some sense of direction where this song was coming from. As she listened and got some direction, she proceeded to the area and was going through each of the dwellings. She came across a young boy that was left behind by his family. She attended to him in comforting him and taking him in now as her own. She wondered of the people as to where they might be in their journey, but had no idea that the group would be splitting up. So as, as the months, seasons, years passed, she raised this boy up to be a young man and then becoming a man. He was told of how he was left behind and how she had raised him. As he grew up, he was taught the tradition of the people. As a young man growing into tradition and had to go through certain rituals before one could journey out of the village, 
and be on his own. So the step stepmother kept with tradition, and the young man now is growing into a respectable traditional table man. <clears throat> Follow tradition, and the days soon to come, he will be allowed to leave the village. As the table people journey through the Hamas region, Towa runners intercepted the Tewa group and asked them to come into their village and perform their traditional rain ritual, for they were being faced with a drought in their homeland. The Tewa people were known for the power of rain and making springs for Queen. They honored their request and were taken to their village. The result of the ceremony was sleep. The Toa religious set were disappointed of the outcome and asked them to leave. So the Tewa people left and continued their journey west to Hopi. As they furthered their distance from Hamas, a runner from Toa came after them. The runner told them the religious leaders asked them to come back, apologizing to them for the sleep turned into water and nourished their land. Tewa people did not acknowledge their requests. They were asked to leave and so they did and con continued their journey to their destination and moved down. And moved down. Throughout the journey, they opened springs for queen to quench their thirst and build up their strength in reaching their destination. As they now approach the Kings Canyon area basin, looking down into the valley, they see a barren land and mesas. The Hopi had promised the Tewa people a land of fertile fields, game, moisture, a place to live. As they looked over the land, many within the group expressed their feelings and frustration and wanted to return back. But leaders of the group said, we have given our men word. In Tewa, we, we say Saint Tu. We we will not go back. We will go on. A marker of the Tewa people was placed at this spot. As they made their way down the mesa top into the valley, through a crevice between the rocks, there they etched the clan sign of the groups which numbered eight. They were the cloud, the bear, the corn, tobacco, pine, sun, earth, and medicine clans. They got, as they got down to the bottom of the valley of the sand dunes, they were met by the Hobi elders of Wapi. Here, a marker was placed by the Hopi to mark their meeting and acceptance of the Tewa people. The Tewa people were allowed to build and live at the base of First Mesa, Hano. Later in time, they were allowed to move to the top of the Mesa. But back at Fiyoke Uinge, the young man grew up and learned his traditional ways, fulfilled his obligation by making a bow and arrows, killing a mountain lion, using the leather for his quiver, killing a deer, killing an eagle, and harvesting the feathers, which were very important for, protect, for protection and cer ceremonial purposes. Now he was ready to leave in search of his, his father, mother, brothers, and sisters, and his people as he journeys on seeking the route of his people.
stopping at villages inquiring about people of his people, stopping and resting at the springs his people were said to have made on their way to Hopi. He travels and now wanders upon Hopi country. Seeing the mesas in the far distance, he journeys into Kim's Canyon Basin. As he wanders, stopping and looking for any sign of life, he hears sounds of faint talk, laughter in the distance, echoed by the wind. Listening closely, he is trying to get a sense of direction where the sounds are coming from. As he now makes his way down the mesa into the valley below, walks to the rolling hills, now he clearly hears voices, laughter of women. As he now sneaks up to see, he sees several women and girls putting water into their water vessels from a oquin, a spring. He now walks towards them from over the small knoll. The women are surprised to see this young man approaching. He introduces himself and tells them he is in search of his family. They acknowledge him. They tell him that they are Tewa. Also told him that two of his sisters are among the group and they are now united. He is, he is now taken to the village and united with the whole family and a family gathering a celebration took place. As the young man grew up, grows up and being older, he takes a wife and at some point in time he returns back home to New Mexico but settles in Pujoque Uinge, San Aldefonso. As for grandmother, she grew in age and passed on making her journey into the spirit world. Today, Yogi Uinge lies abandoned on the east side banks of the Rio Grande, but is probably overshadowed by its new beginning of the people of Fiyoge and Sanwale and Hano. The table language carries on with the descendants of Tewa, Hano and the First Mesa of the Hopi Reservation. Their traditional and religious practices passed down by their ancestors are strong and are carried on. As Tewa brothers of the East New Mexico, we say, yes, so far apart in distance, but in our hearts, we are still one. Good night. Thank you. This is a Um, could you repeat that, Ethan? Did you say it's almost time for questions? Okay. So welcome back. Um, I'd like to start off here. We have a personal message for Art. Uh, Randall Molly, uh, forgive me if I pronounced that wrong says, listening brother, Art Oi. Um, could you repeat that, Ethan? Did you say it's almost time for questions? Not. Sorry, I left my speaker on. So, all right, what other questions do we have here? We've got people tuning in from all over, from uh, York, Pennsylvania, Goodyear, Arizona, Santa Fe, 
Uh, let's see here. Where else do we? We have Bernalillo, Colorado, Virginia. So thank you all for tuning in from all over. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Art? So um, uh, I've got a question for you, Art. Um, you mentioned that you got involved on the project of telling this story because of your close connection with Herman Agoyo. So uh, how did that come to be? How did Herman Agoyo, Herman Agoyo rather, spark your interest in the story of the Well, <clears throat> I Around the time frame of 1984, 85, I uh, was a uh, assistant rookie for the Pueblo of San Juan, but I also served uh, as a um, realty officer. Man was also a tribal official. At one point, he was tribal governor, but in his in his um, Relationship to Piyogi was not just Piyogi. It had to do with the historical events that surrounded the San Juan Pueblo, the old site of Yungay Yungay, the first capital uh, that was made by the Spanish people. And his efforts to uh, restore the historical facts through a cultural center of sort, and then the fact of the old village of Yoga. And it was with that that, um, and he was also involved um, with the, the um, commemoration of Pope's statue and the hat and presentation to uh, the Pueblos as well as Opi. So my working with him and getting involved in the sites of the um, migration sites, pueblos, villages, um, all the way up past Abbey Q, come on down, uh, Mesa Verde. So that's how my interest came about in trying to know more about my people and, and getting to work with uh, various archaeologists. And more recently, I've gotten to work with the Pueblo of Pawaki on the, the site called uh, Kuyemu Uingi. I served as a cultural advisor working under um, Scott Wharton. That somewhat answered the question. Sorry about that. We've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Virginia Ewing Hudson said, I would like to hear more about the current connection between the Hopi and the Tewa people. The, um, I guess the connection is, is that my language, um, we speak the same language, however, there's some, somewhat of a variance. One question asked to me already. Um, it was cited in a book by Yava, the, the Big Yellow Snow, that the, the languages between that of Tewa there at Hano and that on the east side, New Mexico side, was somewhat corrupted by the Spanish influence with their, their um, Spanish words mixed in. But... Um, when I talk to them, they understand their words are somewhat uh, short, but anything short has a longer meaning. So it means the same. And, uh, but uh, I 
guess I had to get used to it when I first uh, started um, listening to them and trying to understand. But more recently, we were to somewhat shortcut. But I would say that their their words are more pure. All right. Um, we have a question from Ethan Ortega. How often do you visit the Yogi? How often? Mm -hmm. Well, um, throughout the years, it lies two miles north of uh, San Juan Pueblo. And I guess you can only imagine by the story as to how big it was. But sadly to say that business uh, overshadowed the land base in time by a gentleman by the name of Richard Cook, who has a company of sand and gravel, another real estate. Well, he leveled most of the area. What's left under is the foundation of the Pueblo of Yogi. And my relationship to that as of today is that there is a project that wants to get started with church and um, services that could be uh, brought to the Pueblo with with uh, Mr. Scott Ordman from the uh, University of Boulder, an uh, archaeologist, to try to lay the foundation of what the village was. More importantly, to be understood, both this uh, Piedra Petroglyph project, as well as Los Luceros, that this land base belonged to the original people. They were people of the Yogi Humi. This was their homeland. And where their businesses and where their services that sit today are sitting right dead the center. So it, it has to be recognized by both groups. Ultimately, the original people has to be part of their base and acknowledge them in their historical um, historical description. And I stress that because they are part of that the original people and need to be represented. Very well said, Art. Um, we have, uh, let's see here, our next question is from Chris Herbst. The other village of Tewa people who went to Hopi, uh, where were they located before they left? Were they people from Santa Cruz? Well, the uh, people from, uh, were from Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz is the site where they were situated. They were the village of Saiwari. But they were southern Tewa, originally from the Galisteo Basin. They also moved because of the Spanish threat, and they ended up at that site. Okay. And today, today all these areas are surrounded by checkerboard areas of, of uh, outside um, Ownership. Um, all right. So our, our next question comes from uh, Betty Jo Childers Acres. Uh, are Tewa and Tiwa close in? Uh, says, are Tewa and Tina? I, I assume she means Tewa. Are Tewa and Tiwa close in distance and traditions. Um, I would say yes, 
um, to some point. Uh, but we also have to understand that there is participation of both Hopi and Tewa together. So they have a combination or our, our practice together. Tewa, uh, every Pueblo is different. Uh, but we have the probably the same plans as winter and summer. Um, so I've got a question from uh, Scott, Scott Ortman, who you gave a shout out to earlier. Uh, Scott says, uh, thank you, Art. Why do you think the Pueblo Revolt does not figure more prominently in the story? Why? I guess if you look at where we are today and what has been taken away and 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 not really recognized, I think that what the what the Pueblo revolt and what it tried to do to its people, its religion, its way of life, by enforcing the outside onto them, that was the reason for the Pueblo revolt. And, and I think that looking around today, wow, you can see how far our land would have gone, would have been from north to south to east to west, and what the, the Spanish um, hierarchy has done in taking the land away from our native people. Um, yeah, wonderful. and uh, I want to just say a little reminder to the members of our audience um, that uh, back at the early, early part of this video, Art mentioned that uh, the, uh, the people who uh, left for um, what would become Hopi Tewa, First Mesa, um, left around the time of the Pueblo Revolt. So that was a... a actually a very interesting question um so all right we have um a question from linda brown uh do you have any thoughts about the uh do you have any thoughts about the trial on mesa prieta the trial Let's see if i can um get that clarified. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Trial, I don't, I don't see, Linda, could you clarify that? Um, but I would also speculate maybe, uh, maybe she means the, the trails. So um, does, Oh, are there any connections between the May uh, sorry between the trails on Mesa Prieta and the moment that people left Fioge for First Mesa? No, I think. Uh, okay, yeah, she means trails. Um, oh, okay. Well, knowing that that the old village set on the east side of the hills, the fields which is now considered Los Luceros, the Mother River, the Rio Grande, Black Mesa, the site. It is, it is somewhat to say that, yes, there are trails going up there. However, they have not been laid out yet. Uh, that's one of the projects that might be starting down the road as, as to where these trails were, um, as well as the irrigation systems, etc. Okay. Um, but I, I, I want to make a clarification. I want to make a clarification regarding the journey to to. Hopi, uh, the springs 
where they stop in their journey, other than Amos, Amos, they, they uh, stopped at a stream called Bear Springs in Tewa, they gave up. And, and from the New Mexico side, they went to Fort Defiance area, stream called in, in the, the Upitewa language, Opipo Springs. In our language, you see the difference between Po. And then they went up James Canyon, where there is another uh, spring. There are um, hot springs, they call it boiling water, Saipo. In our words, here in Tewa, here at home, they say it. So the similarities are there. Their words are short, but they mean the same. I wanted to make that clarification. I think there was a section missing on, on the presentation. Thank you for making that clarification, Art. So we have see here we did Scott Ortman, Linda Brown. Uh, next, we have a question from Michael Romero Taylor. Uh, what does it mean to the Pueblo people to have the statue of Pope in statutory hall at the U.S. Capitol, one of two statues representing New Mexico? Okay, for the Pueblo people, it represents um, your freedom, Recognizing the, the people's um, lives and livelihood. In other words, you know, we were, this was like the first revolution. And the, the Pueblo people took it to the Spanish um, as to their intent of um, um, taking their religion, their, their customs of Garnishing their wages, their food, blah, 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 go on. But I think that it means a lot that um, we were not to be taken lightly. And they, they wonder, they saved their religion. Person. Person, you know, our religion was here first before what was brought in from the outside. And no matter how you look at it, it's one being, and that's this great spirit. Well said, Art. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Timothy Wilcox. Uh, so Tim says, great talk. My cousin's husband showed me where he thought, uh, where he thought, uh, saw where they might be. Did I did I say that right? Saw where where it might be. <laughs> yeah, You're getting good. <laughs> well, saw where is um, is located. Um, I guess uh, north southeast of San Juan, towards uh, Imayo, uh area. And it's in near the and today it's it's the ruins are there. It's in in private uh, land holdings. But I really can't tell you. Being put on this, I had a map and show you. But it is um, in the Santa Cruz area. So uh, next question is from uh, Jane Seiler. Uh, I missed the beginning of this, but are there tours of this Pueblo? Mm, you know, which Pueblo? Uh, I think she's talking about um, Fioge. So, I mean, I can go ahead and field that. Um, there are currently not tours of Fioge Pueblo right now. Um, Art, would you like to uh, explain why that is? 
Well, first of all, it's surrounded by um, private checkerboard areas. Uh, the area is a small portion of what was left of the, of the ruins and the foundation of Kiyoge are, are, are enclosed by a fence. And, and we're trying to, it's, it's under the holdings, the land holdings of Pueblo. And hopefully in the near future, there might be an opportunity to, to lay out the um, foundation of what the village might have looked, for, looked like. And hopefully that, that would be something would be incorporated to both uh, the Mesa Piedra Petroglyph Project as well as Los Luceros uh, as to include as, as part of their uh, historical uh, fact and condition back to the Pueblo. So we have uh, another one from uh, Tessa Cara Archuleta. Uh, she says, my grandfather was uh, Demesio Cata and my father was Manuel Cata Archuleta. Uh, my husband found a photograph of my grandfather that also happens to be in volume nine of the Handbook of North American Indians. Uh, seeing your braids reminds me of grandfather's. My grandfather was born in the late 19th century. Can you talk about them? He and my father, Manuel, collected Pueblo and Navajo music and had their own record label. My father worked as the mailman at the BIA in the only remaining building of the uh, Albuquerque Indian School. Yeah. Well, I'm taken by that because I'm not that old and I really can't think that far back, but I can imagine how our elders look back then because I get to see some of the photographs at some of the sites like the eight Northern Pueblo that represents the governors throughout the, the century and, and what they look like and facial looks and the long hair, um, the representation of tribal government. But I really cannot um, expound on other or those people, because they're older than I am, and I'm not at that age yet. But thank you for the question. All right. And uh, so we have uh, our next question is from Sarah Hume, uh, who says, I grew up in New Mexico and had many New Mexico history classes in school. The return of the Spanish was always portrayed as an event that was welcomed by the Pueblos. I am in my early 50s. Do you think the current public school history classes more accurately portray the feelings of the Pueblos at the return of Spanish? And if not, how can, the, sorry, how can this be remedied? I think that they need to incorporate with the into their um, cultural or history classes to get a perspective of both. It's only one story that's told. So that's my um, thing about that question is that they need to be indigenous um, curriculum included in, in the school system. Um, and just for anyone who, uh, sorry, we're having some low bandwidth issues. So, um, Art, um, did you say they need to have more uh, indigenous teachers in the school systems? Um, Yes, they need to. I mean, throughout. I mean, they. You have uh, talented and educated native people, and in all villages, both in Arizona, besides Ava, 
all the publish here in New Mexico. So, you know, they we're, we're they're educated and they just need to be a situation where the state of New Mexico looks at, or otherwise another state look into incorporating indigenous history into the school systems. Um, yeah, um, and, and totally agreed. Our next question is from Chris Herbst. Is there a group of Hopi Tewa who came back and settled in Abiquiu? Is that part of the story of that community? Well, um, Abiquiu or Abachu uh, is part of the migration, part of the migration route included Abiquiu in today's term of Abiquiu, but they themselves also claim that they are part uh, native and an Abiquiu community is trying to claim uh, they are an indigenous group and seek recognition as far as I know, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I have another question for you, Art. Uh, during your story, you talk about the, um, uh, as the Tewa come into uh, the Hopi lands and they descend down the mesa, that they leave their clan signs on the walls. Uh, is there anything that you could share about those clan signs? Well, those are the clans that came from New Mexico, and those clans um, throughout the generations are still there, and it's uh, incorporated probably with the Hopi as well. But but um, I know that those clans are represented in in their ceremonial activities, so. Let's well, to say that they're acknowledged, and they have representatives that that are that, that are um, designated to carry on and represent those clans. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, very interesting. So we have another question from uh, Jane Seiler. Art, do you ever have dreams of your ancestors? Uh, and she clarifies, uh, if you don't want to answer, that's okay, too. Well, what's your name, Jane? <laughs> yes, Jane. Um, they come nightly, and knock on my door, and wake me up, lift me up, my spirit up, and take me to various religious sites. Yes, they, you know, I, if your heart is open and your heart is true to your religious cause, things do happen. Things are shown to you. And you'd be blessed. They do happen to you. Uh, I just need one moment here. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm looking for more questions. I'd like to make a comment again. Yeah, please. Um, I just want to clarify that um, in the in this story of yoga, is how our, our people left from here and got Dewa or Hana, and and were taken in and and allowed to stay at the bottom where they built their villages. But the other part. 
of how our people helped took care of the issue of the marauding tribes and how they were given um, kept keeping the promise of, of what was promised to them. That that part of history written in a book has shown to you and I don't know if it was shown, but it's part of pages from Hopi history. And it's this book. And that tells the story to how they were people and the warriors took care and and saved that that village of Walpi. And so that's a story by itself and that once our people got to the base, the rest is taken over by the story of Hano, Tewa. Ours just goes from, from here and how they got there. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, excellent reading suggestions, Art. Um, and I would like to thank you for your time, for all your effort in doing this research and uh, and putting together this talk for us tonight. I would also like to thank uh, all of our commenters uh, uh, for everyone who has been um, engaging with this conversation and helped clarify things for us. Uh, and of course, um, I would love uh, I would like to thank Los Luceros uh, Historic Site as well as the um, uh, as well as uh, Jennifer, the project director of the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, for all their work in hosting this event. Um, uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, Art, I'd like to offer you uh, a moment to make uh, any closing comments that you would like to make. Um, uh, there was, I just wanted to, there was a gentleman by the name of, I think you said Randall Molly. I don't know if he had a question or we missed a question from him or he was tuning in. I don't know if he's still on the air. Does he have a question? Um, sorry, uh, could you repeat that, Art? There was a, a gentleman by the name of Randall Molly, oh. from First Mesa. Yeah. I think, I think he had a question. I don't know if I answer, answered that question. Uh, it wasn't as much of a question as, uh, I think he just said, uh, listening brother Art Oi. Okay. Gunda. Why? Kakwai is Hopi is. Thank you. Gunda, Gunda, and Tewa is like. They speak both. So, anyway, um, I guess in closing, I just want to say thank you to the organizations of Mesa Pedra. Patrick Glyph from uh, organization as well as Los Luceros for giving me the honor to present the story of our elders of this village, the Ogilwinge, and that in, in, in the shadow of all this, our people still carry on miles away from here, in First Mesa, descendants of Fiyogi, Taiwari. They're very strong in, the, in their traditional activities. And as, as much as our people were as strong in, 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 in the rain and the springs, they're no different. They, they carry it on. So, in closing, I'd like to say thank you um, to the organizations, to the people um, from around the country, uh, Uinges, uh, the villages within the, around here in northern New Mexico, southern New Mexico, Karis people, 
And uh, there is a lot of history in, in the migration route from Tehuayoga, Mesa Verde. Our people came down as one group, Tewa people. And at one point, the center point is where things started changing in our dialects. But remember, five dialects came out of Mesa Verde. Kiowa, Tiwa, Tewa, Harris, and Towa. Those are the dialects that go back to our home of Mesa Verde. So in closing, Gunda Woha, thank you. And have a good evening. Thank you. And um, uh, our founder, Catherine Wells, as well as our project director, Jennifer Goyette, uh, extend uh, extend their gratitude and a special thanks to you, Art Cruz. And uh, also, I want to slip in a thanks for uh, uh, Ethan Ortega for uh, all his hard work behind the scenes on this one. Um, so thank you all for joining.